Jeremiah chapter 7. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, I, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you throughly amend your ways and your doings, if you throughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Lord, we are blessed, blessed beyond our own comprehension. And Lord, we do have a blessed hope you're coming back for us. And Lord, we certainly thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for the good report from Miss Dawn's father. Lord, uh, I thank you for the good testimonies. I do pray for Brother Jack that's at the hospital right now, that God, you'd touch him. And God, we're trusting you to help him. And God, we pray that, uh, Lord, everything would be well with him. There, Lord, are several who just weren't feeling well tonight. I pray for them, Lord, that couldn't come to church. I pray you'd touch them and help them. Help them to be able to come back, meet with us again as we serve and worship you on the Lord's day. And then, Father, we certainly pray for Brother Ray's dad, Brother Sherman. You touch him tonight as well. Now, Father, for the next few minutes, I pray you to rest our attention. I pray that, Lord, uh, we would truly receive the word of God with gladness. And I pray that Jesus would be exalted and your people would be edified They'd uh, be instructed in ways of righteousness. And, Lord, they'd leave out having a greater burden for those who do not know the Lord. Now, Father, you've been so good to us. Help us, Lord, to bless you. Help us, Lord, to be all we can be for Christ because you gave your all for us. Bless now. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll not fail to bless you and praise you for all you do. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention a couple things as a way of introduction. In verses 1 through 4, we see the proclamation. The Lord spoke to uh, Jeremiah and told him to go preach. And Jeremiah went and preached. And as he went and preached, they didn't like what he had to say, but he went and preached anyway. And you find that he tells them to amend their ways. In other words, change their ways. He told them to thoroughly or thoroughly amend their ways. Uh, don't just uh, uh, sweep the carpet, sweep what's underneath the carpet as well. Get all the dirt out of the way and amend your ways to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, can I say, uh, 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 this time last week, a lot of people were offering up prayers for a football player. I'm not going to throw off on that. Thank God that people uh, had enough sense to pray. Uh, one commentator said, hey, the NFL finally found a reason to take a knee. What a blessing, huh? Uh, uh, but isn't it amazing that after uh, uh, the young man started doing better, and by the way, uh, he got sent back to Buffalo on Monday, and today he's out of the hospital. Uh, 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 isn't it amazing that uh, uh, now that he's done better and now that he's, uh, the, the, he's out of the danger, uh, they're not praising the Lord for answering prayer like Miss Dawn did. Uh, they're praising the doctors. Hmm? 
And that's what's wrong in people's mindsets. When it's out of their capabilities, then they realize they need God. But if God shows them mercy, then they want to take the credit for it or give man the credit for it. And so we see a proclamation from Jeremiah that it's time you get your eyes off of man and give, quit giving man the credit and quit uh, 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 doing the things that uh, come uh, 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 natural to the man and get your eyes back on God. So he gives a proclamation for them to amend their ways. Now, notice how he pinpoints it. Verse number 5. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt. I mean, he names sin. You see, today a lot of preachers, uh, they don't name sin anymore. When you do, you upset people. You can uh, name sin and name adultery and fornication and shacking up, and then all of a sudden you're called racist. Hmm? That's happened to me. Uh, you can name homosexuality. You can name anything that is a sin today, and all you do is offend people. I remember a day when the preacher hung you out over hell, you got nervous. Nowadays, people get mad at the preacher. Miss Annette and I was out this... Uh, uh, past weekend, she wanted a couple places. She wanted to go uh, uh, shopping. She was looking for something specific, so I just tagged along with her. Uh, everywhere we went, uh, I found the same three things. I said, I'm going to get up and preach on this title. I'm going to preach on dope, dykes, and derelicts. That's all I ran into. I'm so tired of smelling marijuana. Huh? I, we, were, we wasn't at some uh, back alley or some honky-tonk or something like that. We walked into TJ Maxx, and I had to go get a shower. I mean, the smell of it was uh, uh, so offensive. And then we walked in, I get to look around and say, well, phew, take your pick about everybody in here is probably smoking it. Huh? It's crazy. And I'm so tired of seeing lesbians, and I'm so tired of derelicts, and, 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 and what a mess. Our, I, I'm talking about in Florence, Kentucky. I'm not talking about under some bridge in New York City or L.A. I'm talking about in Florence. We've got to a place where preachers have quit preaching on sin, and that's why you're seeing sin so prevalent in our society. See, a lot of preachers are afraid to offend people. If I offend people, I will run them off. Well, can I say this, and I do not mean this uh, crassly. I do not mean this uh, uh, obnoxiously. I want to see these pews filled every service. I do not uh, ever enjoy seeing somebody leave the house of God. But bottom line is, if, if the Word of God offends you, if God offends you, you just have to be offended. I, that's just how it is, huh? You know, but we find that he names sin. He pinpoints what they were guilty of. And it's amazing. If I preach on somebody else's sin, it don't bother people. You know? But if I start preaching on being a drunk, and, and, and by the way, social drinking's wrong. If I get to preaching on gambling, that's wrong. Huh? Uh, let me talk to my buddy Ray. Explain this to me. You're older than me. I won't say you're wiser than me, but you're older than me. Explain this to me. They don't let ball players bet on sports. They won't let Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame. But now they've made sports betting. You put an app on your phone and you can bet from wherever you are, and they make that the main thing now. It's no longer about who wins the game. It's about the point spread and how much money you can make gambling on it. Can I help you with something? Gambling's wrong. You know when God blessed America? When America uh, was founded seeking God. Uh, you know why God didn't bless, bless Mexico? Because those that went and founded Mexico went seeking gold. Uh, you know what's wrong with America? America's seeking gold now instead of God. And that's why America's uh, on its way to hell. We find he pinpointed their sin. Again, I get to name and sin. People get real mad, real upset, and, oh, well, I'm going to go home, take two baby ashrams, go to bed, so I really don't care. Huh? 
say, Preacher, if you just wasn't so harsh on some things, we could really grow the church. Well, I've done read the Bible, except the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. And if we've got to have a crowd full of a, a, a bunch of backslidden folks that don't know God and, and are upset any time you preach, I don't need that kind of crowd. I want folks that love Jesus. Uh, I want folks that seek uh, holiness in their life. Uh, and of course, we don't preach on that much anymore either. Anyway, we see that. Notice the promise in verse number 7. I'm going somewhere. Hang on. I'm not going to be mean and nasty all night. Look at verse 7. This is a promise from God. He says, if they all mend their ways, look what he says, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. A lot of you may not know, my first degree that I ever got was in computer programming. And I, don't ask me anything about computers. I don't know anything about computers. I don't know any more than anybody else. I give them to you know, my kids. They figure it all out. But back when I got my degree, all you had was mainframes. The little PCs that you have now, you know, your personal computers, you know, with the screen and the keyboard and all that. They were just coming out, and we laughed at them because they were so slow. Uh, the discs that we had were nine-inch floppy discs. That's what we used. But most of the stuff we did was on a mainframe computer. And uh, 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 what I learned to do in programming computers, what we call machine language. It's a binary code, and, and what makes the computer do what the computer does is dependent upon what you put into the computer. And it's basically called this, if and then statements. If you'll do this, then the computer will do that. I've seen people pound on a keyboard. I've seen people get mad at the computer. I've seen, it's not the computer's fault. The computer's only computing based on what you put in there. If you don't put it in right, it's not going to do it. Don't quit blaming the computer. Blame the one who's operating the computer, okay? It's all based on if and then. If you do this, then the computer's going to... You know where that logic came from? The Bible. You know, the Bible's full of if and then statements. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, uh, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Uh, here God says, if you will amend your ways, then will I do this. Uh, I will give you this land uh, for an inheritance that I promised to your fathers forever and ever. So you've got to understand, Israel's about ready to become under siege. Israel's about ready to be overthrown by the Babylonian kingdom and carried off into captivity for 70 years. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeremiah's prophesying, he's preaching to them, you need to repent, judgment's coming. And God said, I'll turn back the judgment if you'll mend your ways. And yet they wouldn't. Just like many people today, you can tell them, You've got to get saved or you're going to die and go to hell. Uh, back in the 70s, we used to call it this way, turn or burn. Uh, and yet, people love their sin more than they love the thought of being saved for their, from their sin, so they won't turn. You know, I, I saw something uh, that Raven Hill wrote uh, today. He it just simply says, uh, people don't mind you talking about... Uh, 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 being forgiven of their sins people don't want you talking about being holy we don't like that kind of thinking we like just over the bar kind of thinking as long as I'm doing just good enough but God wants us to be holy for he is holy we see the promise now notice if you will the problem look at verse 8 he says, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Hmm? Don't you feel sorry for everybody that believes the Democratic Party? Seriously. I thought we had smarter people than that in America. But the ones that believe in it usually are what we call smart people. Don't you feel sorry for everybody that bought an electric car and they're stuck in a snowstorm? Hmm? Have you seen the pictures of people on the highways were iced over and they're sitting out there and their electric car batteries go... Huh? 
there's a lot of smart people that are pretty dumb. Well, there's a lot of people that's been pretty dumb over the years. They trust in lying words that cannot profit. This is the only thing I'm going to say about Trump tonight. How come he got raided over documents and now they found more damning documents in Biden's private office and it's okay? Where's all that crowd that was calling for Trump's head on the chopping block? Hmm? Anyway, people trust in lying words. We see verse number 9. The Lord just brings it right down to where the rubber meets the road. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense unto Baal, walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do these abominations? You know what that crowd did? They thumbed their nose up at God. You know, there's a lot of people that live wickedly all week long and they'll go to this place that's called a church on Sunday, and because they go to church, they think they're okay. They think God doesn't see all that. Let me talk to my resident former Catholic fellow. Explain, I never understood this. How can a Catholic live like the devil all, late, all week long? Cuss like a sailor, drink like a fish, carouse around, do whatever they want to do, and then go... Uh, uh, com confess to a man in a dress and a boot. There's something wrong with that. And, uh, you know, say a few our fathers and everything's okay. Huh? Go back and do it the same next week. Huh? Huh? I saw something the other day. This guy said, he said he, he went to confession one time and he made up some of the worst things he could thought just to see if he could make the priest blush. Probably wouldn't make the priest blush because the priest was a lush. Anyway, that didn't cost you anything, huh? But here these people are wick living wickedly and expect God to be pleased with it. They offered up incense to Baal. There is nothing more sacrilegious than that. Worshiping a false god and then expecting God to be pleased with you and bless you. God says in verse 11, Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Here's a sobering thought. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And can I say the whole book of Jeremiah, you find truths like this that was going on in their day, and they're going on in our day as well. Now I want to preach on this little thought tonight. I'm thinking on verses 8 through 11, and I'm thinking about these folks that are living so wickedly and yet still come to church and thinking God should be pleased with them. Number one, what kind of church did they have? And number two, how seared is their conscience in thinking that God would be okay with them? You know, the Bible tells us that in, in, in the New Testament that these that adhere to all these false, false doctrines have their conscience is seared. Do you ever wonder how somebody could be a mass murderer? Well, number one, they're full of the devil. But number two, their conscience is seared where they think they're okay doing that. And what's up with people like Jeffrey Dahmer who ate people? There's something wrong. But these people's consciences are seared. Yeah, they're full of the devil, but their conscience has become so seared that it doesn't bother them doing that. With all that in mind, I want to preach on this thought. I want to preach on false churches tonight. Because there are a lot of people going to places called church or places of worship. They're living like the devil all week long. They go to these places and they think they're okay. Huh? I don't know how many people prayed for that poor football player that wouldn't know God if he walked up and smacked him on the head. But they prayed. God must be pleased with me because the guy got out of the hospital. How many people stood outside the hospital? Ask Miss Kathy. She had to drive through it every day. Uh, lighting candles and building all these uh, uh, shrines to this young man uh, in the name of God. 
Show me in the Bible where God told us to build a shrine to anybody. Hmm? God wouldn't even let David build him a house because David was a man of bloody hands. Hmm? There's a lot of false churches which lead to false doctrine, which lead to false ideologies, which lead to false Christians. And my dear friends, in order for them to get saved, they've got to get lost. And it's very difficult to convince somebody that, well, I prayed, to realize God didn't hear their prayer. So let's look at some false churches for a minute. Can I say, first of all, false churches have worshipers. They wouldn't have a building if they didn't have people worshiping. Can I say these false worshipers, they attend their services. I don't know, every now and then, I don't know why I do it, because all I do is get mad. But, and the cable network that we have, the cable system we have, there's like 10 to 15 channels of religion. And every now and then, I'll find myself on there. You know, Jimmy's still singing. Huh? I mean, he, he looks like, the old guy in Star Wars, you know, the old wicked guy. That's what Jimmy looks like. I mean, his facelifts have dropped. You know what I'm saying? He's looking bad. But he's still singing. It still sounds good. Huh? And Jimmy's son does the preaching now. But you say, who's Jim? Jimmy Swagger? In case. Bill, you know him. Uh, but anyway. I watch some of these guys. And, and, and I watch the congregation. Can you imagine coming to church where Joel is and there'd be 10,000 people sitting there? And they had to pay to get in? And then he's trying to sell them books to get out? Uh, how much do you think that globe is worth that spins behind him the whole time he's doing his motivational speaking? The whole time he's going... People attend these places. I don't know if you've ever been to Ball Mall Road on Sunday afternoon, but they've got police officers out there stopping traffic to get that crowd out of crossroads because they had to go get their free coffee and free Wi-Fi, and you can tell a week ahead of time what they're going to speak on. And, you know, they had to take Christmas off because they had to give their, their staff a break, you know, because that's what they do. You know, they don't have a preacher. They pump him in on the screen. So, yeah, But people attend that. And they think they're okay. They have the dancing revivals. Have you seen that? Now, I'm old enough independent Baptist church. I was told we weren't allowed to dance. Remember that? Brother Bob, remember that back in the day? That's why I don't have any rhythm. <laughs> Seriously. Sydney wants me to take lessons in case she ever gets married so I can have a father-daughter dance with her at the wedding. That's going to be bad. I'm going to have to stand on her toes and she's going to have to move me around. Huh? Huh? They have dancing revivals. They had laughing revivals and they'd preach on hell and laugh about it. Can I say there's no laughing matter with hell? Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never intended for the soul of man. And folks that die and go to hell are not laughing tonight. Uh, there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, but they laughed at it. And I'm telling you, people flock to these places in droves. Not only do they have folks who attend services, they have folks who actively support their ministry with monies. Huh? All them guys on TV don't get private jets because people don't give. People give in abundance. And what's the one guy that got caught? He said, you mail him in, in your money, and he'd pray over your prayer release, and then all of a sudden he started getting all these facelifts, and, and they, they videotaped his people just opening the envelope, taking the money out, throwing the prayer request away, and he said that he had to get the, the eye surgery because he got... Uh, poisoned by the ink from stains from weeping over all the prayer requests. I forget the guy's name, but I'm telling you, these guys are nuts. And they have multi 
million dollar homes all over the country and private jets and fleets of cars. T.D. Jake's suits back 20 years ago cost $2,000 a piece and he only wore them one time. Now aren't we supposed to be good stewards of God's money? I appreciate Miss Janet asking me all the time, is that a new suit? No, Miss Janet, I had this suit 20 years. Well, that looks good. I appreciate that, Miss Janet. It's amazing what a new tie will do for an old suit. Hmm? But there are folks that live in excess because of the monies that are given. And again, friend, all you've got to do is follow the money, and you'll find out all you need to know. Hmm? But can I say this? Not only do they have worshipers who attend and who actively support, but these worshipers show adoration for something. And most of the time, it's some form of emotionalism. I mean, they're jumping, they're waving their hands, they're washing windows, they're doing all kinds of things. But it's based upon how they're made to feel while they're there. There's been several reports come out and several documentaries come out on these places that they control the temperature in the auditorium, which controls motions. They have proven that uh, a lot of the songs that they, they sing, the music behind the song brings an emotional response. Uh, if they want you jumping up and down and frothing at the mouth, they give you a, you know, a, a little Doobie Brothers. Uh, but if they want you all calm and, and collected and, and weeping, they give you a little bread. Now, you've got to Google that, kids, so you know, but that takes you way back. huh? You remember bread, don't you, Colonel Sanders? Huh? Uh, hey, them, them guys could sing. Back in early 70s, Mary, yeah. That's where you learned to dance. Listen to bread, wasn't it? Huh? Shut up, Mary. Don't answer that. Uh, but listen, they use music to get people to respond. Can I say, music is soothing. Music is exciting. Music is wonderful, but music is only meant to set the stage for the preaching. Music was never intended to supersede the preaching. Some of you have heard of Barry Manilow, and Barry Manilow was very big in the 70s. I mean very big. He started out as Barbara Streisand's piano player, and he went out on a solo uh, 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 event and became very popular, uh, filled arenas, and folks loved him. Uh, wrote that song, Mandy. I always teach, tease uh, 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 Brother Lawrence's wife. Her name's Mandy. I always tease her about that song. Uh, 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 and uh, all kind of weekend in New England. Wrote a bunch of songs. Uh, very popular. And one night, Barbara Water Walters, who just passed away last week, uh, interviewed him for 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, looking at all his success and all that's going on. And finally, uh, she asked him what he did right before he went on stage. He said, I'll show you. And he took her into his uh, 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 dress room and in there he had a pentagram uh, and candles lit and what he did is he worshipped the devil before he went out on stage and when that came out his career tanked for some 25 years and my dear friends one of the most popular songs he ever sang was a song that says I write the songs that make the whole world sing do you know who the devil was? In eternity past, he was Lucifer, the anointed cherub. He was the minister of music in heaven. And when he got so full of pride because he was the most uh, beautiful angel ever created, he thought that he himself uh, should be exalted above Christ, and that's why he was cast out of heaven, uh, and a third of the angels followed him. Uh, and my dear friends, the devil's been using music for generations uh, uh, to steer people away from the truth of the gospel, to steer people away from God, uh, and have people caught up in their own emotions. Uh, and these people's emotions, Emotions are leading them straight to hell uh, because they're caught up in false churches based on music. I love music. I love singing. I love it all. I do. I love when the pickers and grinners get up on Sunday. I wish we had a whole section of brass. I love the horns. I love it all in its place. And can I say, when it comes to church, what is important is the words to the song not the music driving the song. And I love 
good, godly music where the song honors the Lord, and so does he, because he said he inhabits the praise of Israel. That means he comes and sits down when the song service is honoring him. I love music. That church I go to in Jacksonville, Brother Greg Neal, I hope he gets to come to camp meeting this year. Brother Greg Neal's choir, I, I, I don't know, Brother Josh, I, 250 people in the choir. He's got a full orchestra. I mean, the whole day, and I love it. And I don't know a song they sing because they write their own songs. I don't, but I love it. I'm thinking, man, what a choir, huh? I like it. But I wouldn't like it if all it did was stirred my emotions. What I like about good singing is it gets me ready for preaching. It's the appetizer before the main course. We see false churches have worshipers. They also have workers. You couldn't run that outfit with having workers. They got workers. Matter of fact, Crossroads got somebody there 10, 11 hours a day serving coffee every day and giving you Wi-Fi. They got workers that are pushing their propaganda. Some of them uh, uh, outfits up in New York City, they have people standing out on the street handing out bulletins, inviting folks to their services. Uh, they have workers who work for peanuts who are told they are serving God and God's going to reward them for it. Mm -mm. All the while, the hierarchy is making all the money. Mm -mm. You see, we don't have that problem around here. Our workers, we don't pay them anything. Uh, no, they got workers. I mean, it amazes me the average independent Baptist church can't get anybody to do anything. We are so blessed in our church. Most churches I know of, if the pastor and his family doesn't do it, it don't get done. Oh, they've got workers. They've got worshipers. Can I say something about false churches? They waver. They're constantly moving the bar of what they believe. They're constantly trying to keep up with the times. You know why there's 35 different versions of the Bible? Because they're constantly making it more liberal. And what amazes me, Brother Daniel, is every time they come out with a new version, they don't say, well, we're bringing this one out to correct the NIV. Everyone's an attack on the King James Bible. Hmm? Huh? Because it's the standard. Hmm? Hmm? But can I say they waver on the Scriptures? Let me just help you with this, and you go see Brother Mitch, he'll do much better than that. But anybody that tells you a terminology like this, the Bible contains the Word of God. Wrong. The Bible is the Word of God. It don't contain the Word. They'll say that the King James Bible has 30,000 errors wrong if you read in your King James Bible and the text that it's written in now the, the, you'll see every now and then italicized words script words words that are squiggly instead of block printing what that italicized or script word is basically doing anytime you translate words from one language to another language there could be a barrier for instance Spanish you know, in English, we'll have noun, verb, and then adjectives, or adverbs, and stuff after that. Prepositional phrases and all that. In Spanish, the verb comes before the noun, not after it. And so, uh, in order for it to make sense, if you just translate it line upon line, it may not make sense because it uh, isn't saying everything that it said originally. And so those italicized words are the words that were put in there by the translator to make it mean exactly what it meant in the language that it came from. Now here's the amazing thing about the King James translators. James took a hundred translators. He put 50 in one part of the country, 50 in the other part of the country, and told them, translate the Bible. Translate it to English so every person can have a copy of it. And they both spent time translating it. You have to understand line upon line, precept upon precept. I don't have time to get into all of it. But the bottom line is, is when they brought it together, it matched exactly. Only God could do that. You can't get two people together on something. Only God can do that. When they transferred it into English, that is the 
preferred language, but by the way, I, I gave it to you not long ago on um, in, in Psalms 12, 6, about the seven languages the Bible's come through, English being the purified seventh one. Gave you all that. But here's something else the, the Bible correctors will tell you. They'll say, in the original Greek. Now, first of all, they never say in the original Hebrew. You ever notice that? It's always the original Greek. Note that person, their Bible corrector. Nobody has seen the originals. The originals were written on sheepskin. They have done and gone away. So don't put any stock in anybody trying to add the Apocrypha, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and all these other things. Uh, 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 listen, you can go find all kinds of antique writings. Why don't we throw them in the Bible too? You can find antique Shakespeare manuscripts. Let's throw them in the Bible. Let's throw something else in the Bible. No, that wasn't what God pinned down. What you need to know is your King James Bible came from the Texas Receptus. That's the Greek text it came from. Texas Receptus means the received text. It was the common man's language. That's the language that God inspired the authors to pin it down in. Every false Bible, every one, came from the Vaticanus text. came out of the Vatican. And out of that text, they took whole chapters out that they didn't like. King James Bible is the Word of God for English-speaking people. What can I say? False churches waver on that. They want to pump something else at you, huh? Usually softening sin. <laughs> Usually bringing the deity of Christ down. You know the NIV 171 times took the blood of Christ out? If his blood was mortal blood like yours and mine, there's no hope for us for salvation. His blood came from the Father. They try to make him out to be a man instead of the Son of God. They not only waver on the Scriptures, they waver on making a firm stand. They'll never say some of the things you hear from behind this pulpit. Uh, they're too afraid of offending people. I don't want to offend people, but I want to be true. I want to be right. I want you to understand truth because if you're listening to any kind of news out there in, 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 in this world today, you're getting pumped with partial truths at best. The place you ought to hear the truth is the house of God. But they'll never make a firm stand on anything. They'll never make a firm stand on the Bible. They'll never make a firm stand on doctrine. They'll never make a firm stand on worship. They'll never make a firm stand on anything because they want your money. And can I say they waver on what it takes to be saved. They're constantly changing the bar. Prime example, anybody hear, ever hear of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Jehovah's Witnesses used to teach that uh, they, they took where the Lord said in the book of Revelation that there'd be 144,000 Jews saved out of the Great Tribulation period, 12,000 for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the Jehovah's Witnesses used to uh, uh, say there's going to be 144,000 of them that inherit the earth. The rest are going to die and go to hell. Well, not die and go. They're going to cease to exist. They don't believe in hell. But here's the problem, Brother Phil. When I got up to be about 5 million members, they got to thinking, well, which one of us is going to be the 144,000? So then they started changing. And they're constantly changing. And all of them are changing out there. Huh? They all teach, Brother Bob, you have to earn your way to heaven. You know the Jehovah's Witness has to spend on average somewhere around 20 hours a week in Bible study and another 20 hours a week witnessing. With no hope they're going to heaven. Just earn their way in. The Mormons have to earn their way. The Catholics have to earn their way. Mm -mm. The Methodists have to earn their way. The Presbyterians, Episcopalians, all of them teach a works-based salvation. At best, they teach you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. And what the Catholics, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, what they are teaching is that salvation is in the church. I've got news for you. Uh, uh, this building uh, is going to burn up with a fervent heat. If your trust is being baptized in the waters of this building you're going to burn up too forevermore. Uh, uh, salvation's not in the church. Uh, salvation's in a person, and his name's Jesus Christ. Uh, and we've got to be in him and him and us. And the only way that happens, you must be born again. 
It's not based on my works. The reason they have to constantly be working is because they can't keep themselves saved. And you and I can't keep ourselves saved either. That's why I'm glad Jesus saved me. And He keeps me. And what a blessing to be saved. So they waver on how, what it takes to be saved. Can I say this about false churches? They have a worldly mindset. All their mindset is about gold, not God. All their mindset is about you know, false worship, music, whatever it takes to get a crowd. That's all they're interested in. Hmm? Because like lobbyists and everything else, they believe there's power in numbers. Let me give you the secret. There's power in Jesus. Hmm? Jesus is the majority. We don't need anything else. Just Him, plus nothing, minus nothing, and everything will be all right. And then I'll conclude with this because... I see a couple of you about to pass out. Hmm. False churches have an ineffective wield. By that I mean what they wield or yield or produce does not change lives. The beauty about salvation is that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Jesus not only saves us, he changes us. A lot of these big charismatic churches, they turn over their crowd about every nine months because they can't keep them. Because all the emotionalism wears out. All that emotionalism excites you to come back and all the video game playing that your kids get and all that. The kids realize they can play video games at home and your emotionalism doesn't help you when somebody in your family dies. You don't have any peace. You don't have any assurance. And that emotionalism doesn't help you when you get fired from your job. That emotionalism doesn't help you when your spouse walks out on you. That emotionalism uh, doesn't help you when something tragic happens in your life. Uh, all it does is leave you feeling empty and void. Uh, it doesn't change your life. But I've seen folks face everything from cancer to heartbreak you name it and yet still come to the house of God and worship the Lord because he changed their life Amen. I don't think she'd mind me saying this and if she don't have her hearing aid in she wouldn't hear me saying this but I remember Miss Janet you remember sitting in the old building when you was married to a rascal and he was trying to take your home and everything that you'd worked so hard for over your life you'd only been married to him a short time and you remember, you had friends say, oh, as soon as you get divorced from that man, the church will turn their back on you. What did I tell you? I told you, you need to leave that rascal. Because he wasn't rendering due benevolence what the Bible teaches in Second Corinthians 7, or 1 Corinthians 17. And I stood with you, didn't I? And your church stood with you, didn't you? And you're still here, aren't you? You faced cancer. You faced heart attacks. You faced all kinds of physical problems. You've had... Uh, husbands walk out on you've had all that you had to raise three children by yourself while you had cancer and yet here you are in the house of God and peace with it hmm? you know why because Jesus changed their life false churches she'd never made it huh y'all ever see that picture where a dog's got one leg and one eye and got all these problems, got the mange and everything, and then they call it, it's, you know, it's missing, and they got naming all the things about it, and his name is Lucky. Well, that's Miss Janet right there. Everything in the world's happened to her, but she's still here. Uh, I've lost count of how many stints they put in you. Eleven stints. And I know folks got a runny nose won't come to church. Uh, you know why? Because Jesus did something in her life. Uh, listen. They have an ineffective wield. What they offer does not sustain because it's not of the Lord. I learned a long time ago, most of the time if it gratifies your flesh, it aggravates God. And when all you do is go to church to gratify your flesh, you don't have something that's real. So many 
that go these places, Seven Hills, Crossroads, and all that. They drink and party and everything, but they go to church. I'm glad I have something that doesn't allow me to live that life. Now listen, I drink all the booze I want to drink. I just don't want to drink any. I do all the dope I want to do. I just don't want to do any. I do all the crowds around I want to do. I just don't want to do that. Why? Because Jesus changed my want-tos when he changed me. He gave me a mouth that wants to praise him, not cuss him. Hmm? He gave me a desire, and I fail him every single day, but he gave me a desire that wants to please him, not please the world, not please my flesh. And so God help us to realize there are a lot of false churches. And there's a lot of people going to these churches that think they're okay. Now, you just can't go up to them and say, You're wrong! You're going to run them off. But if you, in compassion and love, tell them you're concerned about them, maybe give them one of them packets. Let God begin to touch their heart. Because talk to this fellow right here. It took a co-worker who cared about him, who every day would share the Bible with him, for him to realize what he was trusting in was wrong. His friend didn't tell him he was wrong. The Bible told him he was wrong. And where do you find him three times a week now? Sitting in the house of God. Why? Because God changed his life. Somebody showed him compassion. And somebody showed him the truth. And that's all those packets are out there, is to let people know the truth. And let God show them what they're trusting in it and real. It doesn't take long for them to realize what all they're doing. God's not pleased with. I shudder to think what would have happened to Israel if they would amend their ways. There's a whole lot of the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and some of the minor prophets. We wouldn't have had to hear anything from them because they'd have got right with God. It'd have been like Nineveh. Revival broke out. But they didn't. But how can they hear? Except we tell them. Except there be a preacher. How can they preach except they be sent? You see, we have to tell them. They're caught up in a lot of falseness. So let's tell them. Let's show them. Let's invite them. Listen. If somebody watched that football player last week and said, you know what, I want to get in church. The odds of them finding our church very slim if they had the mindset you know what I'm going to get a Bible the odds of them going somewhere and finding one first of all is slim nowadays we don't have any Christian bookstores anymore but he, you know if they, if they go somewhere that has a Bible the chances of them getting the right one is slim so we just going to leave them to grope in the darkness to try and find the truth? No, that's why God said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Say, Preacher, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. Just take that packet, let it do the preaching. Hmm? But unless we go, they're never going to see it. They're going to end up in a false church, hearing false doctrine, thinking they're okay. God help us to do our part. Because I promise you, if we'll do our part, God will more than do his part. Too many staying in false churches because they're comfortable. What that material will help them do is not to be comfortable in their sin anymore. God help us. All right? I'm done. All right. Brother Clint, why don't you come? Somebody might want to come and pray and thank the Lord there in the right church. They've heard the truth. Maybe somebody wants to come just tell the Lord they love him. Maybe somebody's here not saved and God convict them. They want to come get saved. So you pick out a song to pick on the guitar. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for truth. God, show us ways in our life that we need to amend. 
And then God burden our hearts for somebody we can give one of them packets to. Maybe change their life. God bless the efforts over those packets. And God do a work. Bless your people. Again, we ask you to touch Brother Jack. And God be with these thy people tonight. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.